that, that just got put into what? The grades page. Yeah, we're going to talk about it right now. It's good. I got it all. I got it all figured out for you. But you'll, you'll have a lot of understanding afterwards. Okay, um, as you can see, Roman numeral one for participation points example. I uploaded some data into your grades page, uh, so we'll work on that a little bit uh, today. Uh, SI schedule tomorrow or today, 12:30. I guess that's pretty much right after class over in Nicholson, and then again Monday at four over in business at Bin One. Uh, okay, let's get down to business. I want to go through a grading example uh, with you about how to handle the iClicker data from Lecture 5 through Lecture 11. The Lecture 11 was uh, Tuesday. All right. So take careful notes because the calculation that you'll do today with me is something that you'll want to do on your own anytime I post um, some kind of roundup of clicker participation. All right, right now in your grades page, you've got three new uh, uh, lines. One of them is roundup as of February 12th, 2012. One of, the next one is the number of answers that you've actually clicked in uh, as of 212. So this is between lecture five and lecture 11. And don't forget, one of those was an exam, and the clicking with that was, you know, in the exam score. And then there was a couple exam, a couple of lectures we didn't have. And uh, and then before lecture five, we had the uh, bonus point practice sessions. And then I also keep track of how many you get correct. Now the reason I keep track of how many you get correct is. If you get 75% of the clicker questions correct at the end of the semester or by the end of the semester, uh, then you get four bonus points on your semester grade. So it's like getting an extra four points um, just to sign your name on the final exam kind of thing. And everybody's going to have the final exam. And so uh, four bonus points on the final exam, think of it that way. Okay. That's like getting a B on all the clicker questions that I asked during class. All right. So... Uh, but what I really want to talk about is the answers and how that uh, calculates out to percentage pointage. Now, the roundup figure is a way of numerically encoding both of these two figures. Okay, so the numeric part, the whole number part, 12 here in this example for this sample student, um, is uh, it tells how many the student has correct. Then the decimal part, the point something something, tells how many you've answered. So when I post, a, and usually I post the roundup, and but from the roundup you can break down how many answers you have uh, from the roundup score. Just look at the, um, the decimal part. Okay, so in this case, uh, this student's decimal part is 0.13. That means that they've answered 13 of the 17 questions, uh, you know, whether right or wrong. And number and the 12 in the whole number part says he's gotten 12 of those correct. Okay, so I, so participation is participation. That's how many you've answered, whether they're right or wrong. Okay, that's the answers. And uh, the correctness is uh, for for bonus points at the end of the semester. Now, a note to all of you, a note to the wise, uh, I usually just publish the roundup figure. But to, today I decided oh, I'll give these guys a break and publish all three. Usually I'll just publish roundup and you'll have to break it down. Not that it's very difficult to just read it off your roundup score. But the question now is what do you do with the 13 and with the 12? All right, let's, let's talk about that. Remember the... The participation pointage, the threshold for getting full 25 out of 25 for your semester grade is 85% participation. All right, so you have to have, you have to know how many have been asked at any point in the semester. So right now we've had 17 clicker items. That means that um, if you've answered 15 or more, 
then you're above 85% and you can just pencil yourself in as 25 out of 25 without any questions asked. It's if you're below that, if you're 14 or fewer, then you're a little bit less than 85% participation. We got to calculate it and I'm going to show you how to do that today. So the student that we have here as of uh, Tuesday, um, uh, he has 13 answer. Now that's, go ahead and write this down, 76.47% participation. So he's a little bit below 85%. It's still pretty early in the semester. So if he's there, if he's here for a session where I ask eight questions and he answers all eight, he's probably going to pull back above 85%. All right. But for, for whatever reason, uh, that's what we, he's got right now. All right, now he's got 12 of them correct because his answer was 12.13, remember. Okay, so his, his uh, roundup score in web courses is 12.13, and that encodes his answers in the decimal part, 13, and his uh, correct answers in the whole number part, as I mentioned. Now, uh, with 13 out of 17, He's below 85%, as I said, so he's got to a solve a proportion. You know, if you're above 85% or, or exactly at 85%, which sometimes happens, uh, then, uh, then you just pencil yourself in 25 out of 25 for your semester uh, grade. But if you're less than that, you got to do this proportion. And it's in the syllabus, and let's do it again. Um, here's the proportion. You take John Q. student's percentage, and you put it in the numerator on the left side, and then in the denominator is 85%, 0 0.85. Okay, so that's the baseline criterion or the target for full participation. Then on the right side, you have John Q. students' pointage, and in the numerator, 25. So in this case, the uh, proportion would look like this. Make sure you write this down. All right, and I want you to solve this, okay, for his pointage, John Q. Stevens pointage, okay, because in the next slide, you're going to need to type in or select an answer, all right? So uh, make sure you have all this down, write down that proportion, and start cross-multiplying and everything, and, you know, however you like to do proportions, and figure out the numerator, JQS pointage. You know, what is John Q. student's pointage? So it's not going to be 25. It might be 24, 23, 22, you know, something below that, All right? And if you have 13 questions answered in your grades page, you'd, you know, you'd have the same calculation. All right, so let's do um, the clicker question. All right, now here's your clicker question, and this is a numeric entry, so uh, let me get my cursor over here. Okay, so, um, so figure out your proportion, then, and then um, hit, the, hit your refresh key if, if necessary after you get the Go Nitro, and I believe it'll start you on the one, and then you just got to you know, click up and down and then and hit the send key when you're finished. Okay. And remember, I always round up. So if you have 11.000001, I round that up to 12. All right. Question? Well, I don't put I, I don't put it into the semester grade till the end of the semester, but you can kind of estimate where I mean we have one exam on the books, and we have a bunch of homework, and that that goes that goes straight percentage wise to 25. Okay, so you just multiply by your total points by how many you possible and, and multiply by 25. This one, so you can actually figure out you know something out of 150 points for one exam, 25 for homework. I mean it's not a semester grade, but 
kind of tells you where you are. And you can do it at any time, you know, no matter what score. My, my point here is that if you're below right now, if you're 14 uh, answers or less, you've got to do this proportion business. You know, if you're above that, you just go ding, 25. Okay, and then you figure out your homework, ding, you know, 23 out of 25, whatever it is. And then add in your exam grade. You know, and so we've had, we have 100 points on the books officially. So that gives you a percentage of where you are right now, and kind of an estimate of where you are right now. It can change drastically because we're still really early in the semester. But yes, question. Yeah, that's what I was just saying. You know, just figure out your homework score. That's just a straight percentage. So, you know, I don't know how many points have been available. Let's say that there's uh, 62 points available on all the homeworks that we've done so far, and you've scored 57 of them. So go 57 over 62, that's your percentage, and then multiply that by 25, and then round it up to the nearest whole, or to the next whole number. And then add up what you get here, you know, out of 20, something out of 25, and then add up your exam score. And actually, you can put in, on top of all that, you can put in if you have any uh, bonus points from early registration. And I believe that I still have some work to do with all that. So, um, but yeah, that's kind of how you do it. You get it there. And right now, we have 100 points uh, on the books. 50 from exam one, 25 for homework, 25 for clicking. Let me see what you guys are typing in here. Yeah, not too bad. Uh, okay, uh, 30 seconds to get in your answer. Twenty seconds. Ten. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All right. And let's look at your guys' results. Yeah, we're doing pretty good. Um, uh, he has 23. Raise your hand if you voted for uh, 23. Okay. Now, I see a significant number of you voted for 22. So what you did is you, you rounded down. You rounded to the nearest. Always round up. So he had 20. What was it? 22 point something something, right? Yeah, so it's 22.47 or something like that. Yeah, so normally in math class, you would round that to 22 if you, if you want to round to the nearest whole number. But we're going to the next whole number upward so we always round up and that's my way of giving you guys the benefit of the doubt uh, on uh, stuff like the participation pointage and also homework okay, so you're not at the tyranny of decimal points and stuff all right so let's um, now as i said let me just reinforce with that uh, you can do this at any any point in the semester and you can do it now uh, because you have a roundup. Now, I might publish another roundup in two weeks or three, usually three, four times, maybe five times, including the very last week of the semester. And uh, you can kind of keep tabs on where you are participation points wise. All right. So, so that's kind of an informal uh, homework assignment for the weekend. All right, let's talk about recoil. Uh, I had a bunch of students in discussions saying, Dr. B, what about this number five business? Um, and here's the basic upshot. Um, whatever delta P the bullet gets, you know, they're going to get some rightward delta P, and the rifle's going to get some leftward recoil delta P, but it's going to be the same amount. So uh, it's just an opposite direction. And remember, the it, the way that we phrase Newton's third law, equal but opposite reaction, 
The equal stuff is the exchange of momentum, delta P. The delta P's are equal in size, but opposite in direction. All right, so here's the, here's a picture of a simplified picture of a, a ball in a, you know, it's like a, a musket ball in an old timey rifle. And it's going to be interacting with the gas, you know, right here is the, this over here, right here's the gunpowder. So that's going to go bang, and the gases are going to expand through the tube, pushing the musket ball out. And the interaction time or the interaction distance is basically the length of the barrel. So you shoot the thing, and, and the, it goes flying out. Now, you're going to get a little bit of delta R, uh, de excuse me, delta X for the rifle, a little bit of recoil, all right? And so I just budged the rifle a little bit to the right uh, with that. And uh, de uh, just a side note, the size of the um, Delta X for the rifle might be large or small, depending on the bullet, uh, the specs of the bullet, and, the, uh, and also the specs of the rifle. So if it's a really heavy rifle, then it's not going to recoil a whole lot. But if it's a really light rifle, like, you know, that picture of uh, Will Smith in MIB with the little uh, noisy cricket, it's a really light little thing. And the interesting thing in that, um, in that show was every time he fired it, he got recoiled back the other way and, you know, right onto his keister. And, so, and part of that is because the gun was so light. Now, if you have a cannon... You know, cannons are going to, you know, you know, they're going to um, fire bigger cannonballs and stuff. So I guess it, you know, but, you know, when you see, you know, a cannon in the artillery, you know, they recoil backwards, you know, sometimes several feet. You know what would be cool is to see one of those big battleships, one of those big battle wagons. You know, they have these big guns. They fire shells the size of a Volkswagen and, uh, you know, for miles. And they do it with accuracy too. It's pretty, it's pretty ferocious. But they must have monstrous recoil. So let's take a look at this um, uh, problem, question five. Uh, and I'd like to point out something in here that I think um, a few of you may not have caught on first uh, reading. Take a look at this. See where I have the red circle? Take a look. Eyes up. Take a look. Eyes up. Ready. Okay. Because we had a lot of people messing up. Uh, whenever I say the size of something, that just means a positive number. So, yeah, I mean, if, it's, if, the, if the bullet goes to the right, the rifle's going to get some leftward uh, momentum, so a negative number. But if I'm asking about the size of it, I just want to know how many kilogram meters per second. So you didn't have to type in a negative number on this. And if you did, it would be marked incorrect. So whenever you see size, remember that. I'm just asking the magnitude, just how big it is, not the direction. All right, so let's move that up to the side. Um, so let's look at the, in the, in the example that I had, um, it was uh, 200, the bullet was moving at 285 uh, meters per second, which is pretty fast. Um, but it's got a pretty small mass, 0 0.025 kilograms. So its momentum, you know, the momentum that it acquires from the outward push from the gunpowder uh, is uh, 7.125 kilogram meter per second. Now, that may not seem like a lot, but it's concentrated into a little tiny bullet. And so if you got hit with that much momentum in a little teeny bullet, uh, that means that there would be a lot of um, uh, kilogram meter per second momentum per square inch on your body, and it would penetrate your body. And, and that's, you know, that's what bullets are designed to do, you know, to, to, you know, break things and kill people, as they say in the army. So whatever the, the bullet gets, 7.125, the rifle gets the same size but opposite. So... Write down that last equation. Delta P of the rifle is equal to minus delta P of the bullet. And that means 
the same size but the opposite. The minus sign in this context means opposite direction. So no matter what direction the rif rifle is, or the bullet is, the rifle's got a delta P in the opposite direction. Right? So if the, if the bullet went upward, you, you would say, all right, the opposite of that is downward. Easy. All right, so it's negative. But since I asked for a size uh, all, all, and to the nearest tenth, all you need to do on this one was type in 7.1 and hit the <laughs> submit key. Now, some of you are saying, boy, I don't know. Something's not right about this. But I, I've checked it about 60 zillion times. It does work. But you have to be remember that some of the specs, like the mass of the bullet, its speed, the mass of the rifle, all that stuff, change randomly. At least one of those numbers changes randomly. Also, you do not need the mass of the rifle, 1.5 kilograms, for this problem. If all I want to know is how much uh, momentum it acquires, you know, you don't need to, uh, you don't need to use the, its mass. If you want to know how much speed it acquires, yeah, you do need the mass. Uh, Kelsey. No, 7.125 is closer to 7.1 than 7.2. Yeah, that's for eye clicker. That's for that's that's for Dr. B grading. But but yeah, so that's that's the only time we do that. Is in grading. But in they, you know, so this one you go to the nearest. So everything other than grading, go to the nearest. Question. That was in the statement of the problem. Let me, let me cut backwards. Let me see if I can do this. See there it is. And, and, and that's one of the factors. Oh, this one says 206. But the one that I did before, you know, I grabbed this image. But, you know, we could do it for 206. All right. And the, the one that I did was 285. And, uh, and some of you may have had 285. You may even remember having 285. Um, but whatever. And that, that's an example. What is your name again? Raven. Raven. Uh, Raven, this is an example of how the numbers on every attempt change randomly, at least one of them. Okay, So the previous attempt for me was 285. Now I got a 206. See, but the strategy is the same. So if you can focus on that, you're good. All right, so let's keep going back through this stuff here. Yeah, I, I thought I had a 285 on that one. But... All right. Any other questions on this one before we continue? Yes. Yeah, if I if I wanted the momentum and not the size of the momentum, then and and but the thing is if I if I wanted the momentum with directionality encoded, I'll always say it I'll you know how I always say let's, see, let's go back. You know, well, it's not on this, but I always say, for instance, e.g., if your answer is, then type in, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'll always include, if, if there's a possibility of getting a leftward answer, um, I'll type in, if your answer is negative, uh, you know, 25 kilogram meters per second, then type in the minus sign and to indicate leftward, and then 25 point one or you know whatever your answer is so i'll i'll try to always do that but if you don't see that and you're tempted go back and look to see if you see the word size in there because that tips you off to, that you don't need to, to type in the direction so that's like the difference between velocity and speed speed is you know no matter what direction you're going 25 miles an hour is 25 miles an hour on your speedometer okay whether you're going south or north, east or west, or any other direction. But if I ask you about velocity, then you would say 25 miles per hour, comma, west, or minus 25 miles per hour if, if you agree that minus means to the west and positive is to the right. So, yeah, you're welcome. Another question? Does my voice sound dry? 
raspy a little bit. It, it doesn't. It feel, I feel raspy. Like I want to drink some water. All right. Let's keep going through this. All right. Now, last time we were talking about momentum and the symmetries of space-time. Let's get a little deeper into that. Um, and let's talk specifically about coordinates again. Um, you know, if we want to make some kind of a diagram or calculations, we set up a coordinate system. And uh, usually um, we're doing, you know, calculations like distances, curvatures uh, in a, an XY coordinate graph paper type system, All right? Um, and, you know, you take various events and you map them out on your system, and then you make decisions and calculations based on that. Now, it's possible that you use something other than rectangular, okay? It doesn't have to be X, Y, and Z. It could be spherical or some other curvilinear system. Like this picture here is the latitude and longitude on Earth. You know, and if you, and actually, uh, I think your GPS runs on the latitude, longitude, and then vertical is the third, uh, uh, probably elevation above sea level is the third number in the GPS. And if you look at Google Maps, they map out locations by very, very um, careful latitude and longitude numbers. I mean, it's like, you know, like for Bozeman, it's 28 point something, 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 something. They got about seven decimal points of accuracy, and that's, that's GPS. All right. But, you know, for us, most of the time, we're going to be working in rectangular coordinates. Now, Einstein says that we have to use time um, as more than just a bookkeeping tool for calendars and checkbooks. You know, we have to consider it the fourth dimension. And so for that reason, um, we, we call the grand book of the universe space-time. And we want to treat time as if it were an X, Y, or Z coordinate as much as possible. Now, Einstein figured out that you can't actually treat it exactly like X, Y, and Z. There's something fishy about the time core, about the nature of time, and we don't really know why. But when you're, for instance, if you're figuring out a distance in X, Y graph paper, you go x squared plus y squared, and then add those up, and then you square root it, and that gives you the distance. In three dimensions, you just do x squared plus y squared plus z squared, add them up, and then square root the result, and that'll give you the distance in three dimensions. But in four dimensions, it's, it goes like this, minus t squared plus x squared plus y squared plus z squared. There's a minus sign in front of the, time, the square of the time uh, coordinate. And that is different. And that is all of relativity is encoded in there. It's, it's what makes our space time so unusual. Now we mentioned it last time that you can make a, a four dimensional vector or a four dimensional set of specs to represent the dynamics. Here's a, you know, a nice little representation so space-time position, a stack of four numbers, time, x, y, and z. And then the dynamics will be encoded in a four-dimensional stack of numbers. Uh, the energy, which we're going to study today, uh, and momentum, uh, the three components of the momentum. So the momentum is spatial, and x, y, and z are the, what we call the spatial coordinates. Uh, the energy is in the very first slot usually, and uh, that's considered the temporal slot or the zeroth slot of the fourth dimension. And time is in the zeroth or the very first slot of that four, the stack of four positions. All right, so we're gonna be working, uh, we're gonna be working with energy. Now we're not, to, to actually handle these kind of four dimensional vectors, you have to do a lot of fancy geometry that would cause grad students to cry for cry home from mom. Okay, it's very difficult. Uh, but the structure of it is not too bad. All right, now let's do something else. Let's make a space-time graph, a simple space-time graph. And what we're going to do is we're going to make x 
axis horizontally. And then we're going to make the time axis vertical. So that vertical axis, you know, we want to treat time as if, if as much as we can, equal footing with the spatial dimensions, in this case, x. To make that axis be measured in meters, we're going to actually label it as the CT axis, okay, instead of just T. All right, so it's not going to be the time axis. You know, like in the velocity graphs, we just had time axis horizontally, and we had B vertically and stuff. But this one, we're going to have CT. So this is going to be the CT axis. And what that means is that the units of, of distance are like light years. You know, it's the amount of uh, distance light travels in one year, or, you know, light minutes or light seconds. You know, the amount of time that light travels in one second or one minute. And the solar system is measurable, easily measurable in light seconds and light minutes. The Earth is three hundred light seconds. Wait a minute. Uh, the Earth is I think it's 300 light seconds from the sun. And like Pluto's out like minutes away from the sun. It takes minutes for stuff to get out to Pluto because it's a lot further. Okay, so here's our vertical axis and we're gonna label it CT. All right, so park a CT up there. And that just means we're measuring in light seconds or light years or something, All right? Which is what astronomers do. Now let's make a set of equally spaced horizontal slices. And I've got four of them. And so in the distance, the CT distance between each one is C delta T. So if we take, you know, so if we take delta T equal to one second, the separation of each of these horizontal lines is one light second. So C delta T, C delta T, another C delta, delta T, another C delta T, and so on. Now the reason I'm bringing this up is because on those horizontal slices of space-time, there is a formula that works really well and is expressly organized for that, and that is the impulse law, because the impulse law is organized in terms of delta t's. Now, now this is Sir Isaac Newton's impulse formula. He doesn't have the ct in there, because uh, that, you know, that, that didn't come into consideration until Einstein's time. But it has delta T in there, and that is significant. Uh, so the impulse uh, law, F delta T equals delta P, is designed for and uh, comprehensible on those horizontal uh, slices um, across space time at a given time. Question? Speed of light, sorry. C stands for the speed of, you know, like in that famous formula, e equals mc squared. Yeah, that's the speed of light. The energy of a particle, is its mass times the square of the speed of light. Now, let me take out those C delta Ts. Let's do some equally spaced vertical lines. All right. And let's make those delta Xs. And they're squares, so they're the same size. So these are one light second across, but we'll call them delta x's. And so, you know, the, the impulse law is good on the horizontal slices. So logically, you might say to yourself, all right, if I'm supposed to um, take the space and time dimensions as equally as I can, treat them the same uh, as much as I can, um, is there a law uh, that is shaped for the vertical delta x slices? You know, for horizontal slices, f delta t. Nice, perfect, sweet. Okay, good. Now, what if you make um, slices across time at the same position, delta x, or 2 delta x, or 3 delta x? You know, what uh, formula is useful and organizable under those terms. 
under that partition? And the answer to that is a kinetic energy at work. All right. And so the law of the, the work formula is F delta X is equal to the change in the kinetic energy. And uh, the, the kinetic energy is defined down at the bottom here. It's one half MV squared. And raise your hand if you've had calculus class. A few of you. Do you see, do you see a little calculus in one half MV squared? And it, there's a whole lot of calculus. Now, we're not going to go through the calculus, but it's a calculus result. And so that goes, the, the change of kinetic energy goes on the right side. F delta X is known as the work. So capital W here stands for work. And so the work F delta X, so the force times the spatial displacement. You know, impulse is force times temporal displacement, the elapsed time or the contact time. This one is force times interaction distance. Right? So as long as the force is acting through some distance X, it changes the one half mv squared kinetic energy. Now in that kinetic energy, you could figure out V and you could figure out momentum stuff. Uh, so you can, you know, use one to calculate the other, but it's essentially a separate thing. Now, the metric unit of work is the joule, 1.00 kilogram meters per second, excuse me, 1.00 kilogram meter square per second squared. Uh, so here's, here's a sample calculation, All right? Here's a picture of uh, Professor Jewell, James Prescott Jewell, British guy. He's got the, you know, before James Harden was cool, James Prescott Jewell was blazing the trail, All right? He led the basketball league at, at Cambridge in, uh, in assists. Anyway, so that's James Fred. He, he figured out a lot of uh, energy and thermodynamic stuff. So they named this after him. All right, so this is like the calculation of the kinetic energy, one half mv squared, of a liter bottle of water that's moving at one meter per second. Okay, so the mass is 1.00 kilograms. The speed is 1.00 meter per second. You square it, and then you multiply all those together. And uh, that's uh, 0 0.05 kilogram meter squared per second squared. All right, now I want to emphasize these two versions of the answer. You can say 0 0.5 joules and use the capital J to symbolize that. Or you could equally and just as um, properly write it as uh, 0 0.5 kilogram meter squared per second squared. Now, the reason that that's sometimes nicer to use um, kilogram meter squared per second squared instead of joules is because sometimes you want to cancel. You know, you're trying to figure out a, a mass. So you want to have the mass in, 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 in explicit everywhere in your equation. Then you can maybe cancel the other things. So like if you're after a mass and you have any, instead of writing it as a joule, you write it as, you know, 0 0.5 kilogram meter squared per second squared, you're going to, you know, try to get, you know, cancel meter squared per second squared and be left with kilograms. All right, so for, for canceling, it's uh, sometimes nice to have that. Now, another way of looking at a joule is this way, uh, F delta X. Okay, the, the, the previous one was, um, you know, the change in the kinetic energy. This one's the work. Uh, so a one Newton force going for one meter changes the kinetic energy by one joule. And that's also known as one Newton meter. And Newton meter is also the same as kilogram meter squared per second squared. So sometimes if you're in an energy formula and you're trying to figure out a force or you're trying to cancel a force and get a distance, this might be the, you know, the best way to, to convert um, uh, your answer, all right? So joules, newton meters, and kilogram meters squared per second squared. 
All right, let's work at uh, an example here. Oh boy, I forgot to animate this. All right, so here's our example. Um, you take a 30 gram, a 30 kilogram little kid moving at 8.5 meters per second. And he slows, you know, so he's at this, the ice skating rink or something. And he has a frictional force of 8.8 .8 newtons negative. Now what is the stopping distance? All right, so what we're going to use is F del work equals F delta X, and that's equal to the change in the kinetic energy. So KEF minus KEI. All right, so when, and so uh, make a note of it, students. If you have a stopping distance problem, usually it's easier to work with the work formula, at least to start. You know, you may have other things to do with it, but to start to figure out that stopping distance, most of the time the work formula is simpler to use. If you have a stopping time problem, the impulse formula is usually a little bit better strategy to start with. All right, but either one, you can, you can make either one do the job. All right, so number two, let's compute kinetic energy initial. Comes out to 1.083.75 joules. So if you look at there, Ke subscript I equals one half m times v subscript I quantity squared. So that's 0 0.5 times the mass of the little kid, 30 kilograms, and then 8.5 meters per second quantity squared. Now don't forget to square it. You know that meters per second quantity squared gives you the meter squared per second squared in a joule. You can't, you know, you can't drop it. If you forget it, you're going to have kilogram meter per second. That's momentum. Okay, you don't want that. Not in this equation anyways. All right, so that works out too, as I mentioned in 2A uh, and B, uh, 108.3.75 joules or 108.3.75 newton meters. Now we're going to use newton meters because we're going to be canceling some newtons. All right. So now final kinetic energy is zero because he's sliding to a stop. Kelsey. Delta K equals 0, 0.0 newton meters minus 1.0. Well, I have the I have the second formula. The result is over in two A and B, right? So if you calculate that second formula, you come out with 1,083.75 joules or 1,083.5 newton meters. And then for the third formula, delta K E, you also need the final, you know, because a delta is always final minus initial. Right. So final kin so number two is the initial kinetic energy, 1083.75. Uh, number three is the final one, but that's cinchy because it's it's just zero because it's not moving. It's come to a stop. So now your final minus initial is 0, 0.0 newton meters final minus 1083.75 newton meters initial. And so that's a negative number. And that is why, and I'll, I'll just give you all a warning and, a, and an admonition to be very careful with your SIGN, the sign of your uh, delta X's and, and your forces, right? So if you know that something like in, in, the, in the preamble at the top, it says VI equals 8.5 meters per second. That's a positive number. All right, so you can, if you want, you can make, assume that that's 8.5 meters per second to the right, All right? But if that's, the, if that's the direction of the motion, the friction is the opposite direction. So whatever you have for the motion, VI, the friction is going to be the opposite direction because that's how friction works. Friction never speeds you up. It only slows you down. So it's always the opposite direction. So if you say that the motion is... Uh, positive 8.5 meters per second, which we do, uh, then you have to say that the frictional force is, is negative 8.8 .8 newtons or whatever size it is. It's got to have a minus sign, all right? 
Now that comes in in step five, the F delta X part of the equation. Now that's negative 8.8 .8 newtons for friction and delta X. By the way, the frictional force is usually a denoted lowercase f. So for you'll see me using that notation for friction. Otherwise, I'll, I'll usually make my forces capital Fs. Uh, so anyways, so the, L, the F delta X side has a negative sign in it. The delta K E side has a negative sign in it because it's 0 minus 1,083.75 newton meters. So I've got, and, and that's with the last equation down there, negative 8.8 .8 newtons uh, delta X equals negative 108.3.75 newton meters. Now, if you divide both sides by 8.8 um, .8 newtons negative, you'll cancel, out, you'll cancel out newtons from the right side, and you'll get meters. So that's going to give you the right answer, and it will cancel negative signs. Matter of fact, you can cancel negative signs at this stage if you want. Just drop them you know, and do your calculation. All right, click your question number two. I want you to hit your refresh key because it's multiple choice. Get my cursor back over here. All right, here's your, so I want you to calculate the stopping distance. Have you got everything down here? All right, stopping distance, delta X. All right, go ahead and answer. And this photograph shows a little kid at the skating rink. Actually, a little kid at the skating rink that's not not gonna fall and slide because it's all <laughs> she's holding on to her mom. I never noticed that before. But one of the other people could slip and fall. Raise your hand if you if you can ice skate backwards. Good. Raise your hand. Raise your hand if you can ski backwards. Nice one guy. Good. Hey, anybody in here water ski? I bet, I bet a lot of you. Raise your hand if you water ski. One person. This is Florida, and only one person water skis. That's it. Do, you, do you ever water ski backwards? So you so wakeboarding, you do that. You do all those kind of spins and stuff. Yeah. That looks like fun. All right, uh, 20 seconds to vote. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay. And correct answer, 123 meters. So that little kid is going for, for a long slide. Uh, but anyways, now... Um, let me just double check something here. Um, any questions about that calculation? Do you want to go back and look at it? You might double check it. Go ahead. Let's let's look at the. It's all in here. Now go ahead and ask me a question. Fire ahead. Raise your hand and then. Okay, in the back. Uh, from, from this point, 
from, from this point down here. Um, the way that you do that is you divide both sides by negative 8.8 .8 newtons. And if you do that, then you'll have newton meters on the top and 108.3.75 negative. And then you'll have negative 8.8 .8 newtons on the bottom. So newtons and newtons cancel. And you're left with meters. And then the, the negatives cancel. So, you're, so your calculation on that is 1083.75 divided by 8.8. All right. Yeah, I, I just didn't have enough room to show the calculations. But, the, you know, the thing is, KE subscript I, let's, well, let's just review it. Eight point, okay, so what's 8.5 quantity squared? That's about 70 something. Okay, 70, so a uh, uh, young lady. Caldwell. Okay, so Caldwell. Um, in this part here, you've got 70, so 8 point, let me move this right here. That's 72.25, and it's meters squared per second squared, right? Because it's, it's 8.5 squared, right? So you, mo so you go 72.25. Does anybody verify that, 8.5 squared? Is that, uh, is that true? 8.5 squared? Is that, yeah, okay. So 8.5 squared, 72.25. So multiply 72.25 times 30. Okay, so that's going to be 2100. Uh, so what is that, 2100 and change? Who's got it? What, what do you got? Yeah. 2001. Okay, so does that sound... So does that look about right, Caldwell? Yeah, because this is, so this is 72.25. This is 30. So 70 times 30 would be 2,100. All right, so this is a little bit bigger than that. So that's why I guess it's, you know, 21 something. And by calculation, so you could write down underneath uh, 0 0.5 times 30 times 72.25 and then 0 0.5 times to 2167, uh, 21.67.1.5, and then just multiply by 0. 0.5. And that brings you down to 108.375, okay? And so so that's that's how that one calculates out, all right? Is that, a little, is that helpful? All right. And then the KEF is cinchy because it's at rest. It's stopping. Anytime you have a stopping problem, you're going to have one of your dynamical quantities equal to zero. In this, in this case, K, kinetic energy final. So, so final minus initial is zero minus 1083.75. And then you're, so that's here. So this part right here is equal to delta KE. So delta KE up here, the right, the right hand side of the work formula, that's equal to this jazz when you actually calculate it all out. Okay. Now you still have the left side. So here's the work formula. You have F delta X. And we don't know what delta X is, but we do know that the friction force is negative eight. So when you bring in the friction force, uh, here, here we're, we're using the left side of the work formula. We're putting it all together, in other words. Uh, so now your negative 8.8 .8 is in here, and you can uh, solve for delta x by dividing. Okay, is that is that helping a little bit? Call them up.
Yeah, I, I should have made two slides out of this, I guess. Uh, what's some of the other, listen to some of the other questions and answers, and then we'll come back and we'll talk about it after class. If you got to. Uh, okay, question here. Cancel. Yeah. Right. So, so up here, all this jazz up here gives you kilogram meters squared per second squared. That's a joule, but it's also a newton meter. So why not use newton meters down here? You know, you can do it on joules. You know, but you know, when you do it this way, newton meters, you can see the stuff you have to cancel. Another question. What? You guys are? Thanks. Uh, another, any other questions? You know, I might make a talking PDF of this. It's a good one to, and I'll talk my way through the entire calculation. How about that? And you'll see it on the PDF and everything. That's fair. Yes. No, the frictional force is given plus the size of the little kid, 30 kilo, kilograms, and his initial speed. Yeah, that's given. The other, the, the thing that you have to calculate is made of uh, his mass and his speed. So you got to figure out what FMV square is. That's not given. But you can you can get it from his mass and his speed. So, so and there's lots of different ways to to do this stopping distance problem. Another question. Okay, uh, let's continue. Um, and we'll dismiss at this point. You'll have a big homework this weekend. Look for it by lunchtime tomorrow, if not sooner. Um, and I'm going to give it a, an extra number of attempts. Also, I, so that you have extra practice to get things squared away. Also, I want you to use discussions and talk it over like we did here in class if you get stumped. Okay, you're dismissed. I'll see you next week.